nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. On Saturday, July 8, 2006, prominent Nevada state politician Kathy Augustine was supposed to attend a political fundraiser, but she never showed up. She lay dying in her bedroom. This was so up close. This was so personal and so cruel and heartless. Husband Chaz Higgs may have thought he'd planned a perfect murder, but the former US Navy medic turned nurse came to learn that loose lips do indeed sink ships. Were it not for the concerns of a private citizen, of Miss Ramey, uh, certainly this case would have been the perfect murder. Born in 1956, Kathy Augustine went on to become Nevada's first female state controller. A trailblazing politician, her sometimes turbulent public life overshadowed an even rockier personal one. Kathy Augustine was a very smart, very dynamic woman. She was very well educated. Education played a huge part in her life. She had gone on to get a master's degree. She had done a lot of different jobs. Kathy Augustine met 39-year-old Chaz Higgs while her estranged third husband, Charles Augustine, was being treated for a stroke. Kathy Augustine had been married three times before she met Chaz Higgs. He was a critical care nurse at Sunrise Medical Center in Las Vegas. Her husband, her third husband, Charles Augustine, uh, had been taken to Sunrise Medical Center as the result of a stroke. He had suffered a minor stroke, then suffered a major stroke, and was in the hospital being cared for in the critical care unit. Uh, he was actually recovering. He was doing a lot better. And uh, in the course of his care there, Chaz Higgs was his nurse. At the time, Kathy and Charles Augustine's marriage was in trouble. Kathy had moved out of their home in Las Vegas into a house she owned in Reno. Chaz Higgs was taking care of Charles Augustine. And Kathy was visiting routinely, of course, to visit her husband to see how he was doing. Their marriage was actually on the rocks at that time. They were making plans to divorce. Despite the plight of their marriage, Charles Augustine was making a steady recovery in hospital. His family was actually in the process of preparing to bring him home and they were making arrangements to have resources brought into the home and continue his recovery there. Shortly before he was supposed to be brought home, he died in the hospital. Kathy and Chaz embarked on a whirlwind romance. Less than a month after Charles's death, Kathy stunned family and friends with an announcement. She described him to her family as an angel who has swept me off my feet. Chaz said for his part that they had chemistry, they had instant chemistry. And three weeks after Charles Augustine passed away, uh, Chaz and Kathy were married in Hawaii. Chaz Higgs had been a medic in the US Navy before becoming a nurse. When he met Kathy, he had already been married and divorced three times and had a string of bankruptcies behind him. But despite his checkered past, Kathy thought she'd finally found the love of her life. She wanted consistent love in her life. She wanted someone who would love her and care for her. And I think truly she thought she had found that with Chaz. Moving into her Reno house, Chaz continued to work as a nurse, while Kathy 
pursued her political career. She had successfully ridden out a political storm after being impeached in 2004. But she couldn't weather her increasingly turbulent relationship with Chaz. Hopes for a happy marriage began to fade. When people, other nurses would say, hey, Chaz, is there anything I can do to help you? Yeah, kill my wife. Get rid of my wife for me. That's a lot to carry around. And he was very open about it. They had an extremely acrimonious relationship toward the end. They were fighting constantly. He was starting up relationships online. Reno has some of the most relaxed divorce laws in the country. The city is even popularly known as the divorce capital of the US. Yet Chaz avoided pursuing one. I'm certain that uh, Kathy's family couldn't understand why Chaz had simply not divorced her, not moved on, not just ended the relationship. That seems to have been a much preferable option. But generally speaking, I think most murderers are on some level unbelievably selfish and perhaps a bit narcissistic. Their needs, their wants are more important than anyone else's. Chaz wanted Kathy dead. Inflamed with resentment and fueled by arrogance, Chaz Higgs was convinced he had picked the perfect poison to mask a murder. Succinylcholine, a muscle relaxant. The body's capacity to rapidly break it down renders succinylcholine virtually undetectable. Sux was short for succinylcholine. It is very short term and fast acting, but it completely paralyzes or renders inoperable the muscles in your body. So you're able to uh, insert the tube without the gag reflex and things interfering in that process in a medical emergency. Doses of succinylcholine are designed to be for the very short term. An overdose, however, would be catastrophic. That's probably as cruel as you could be to a human being. I mean, just, it suffocates you, the drug does. You know, that's not quick, it's not painless, it's awful. You can't breathe, you can't talk, you can't move, and you can't get any oxygen anywhere. Your heart's still beating, but there's no air or oxygen in your bloodstream. You are dying and it hurts. Critical care nurse Chaz knew this. And police believe he went ahead and took some from the hospital where he was working. Overnight, on that fateful weekend, Chaz Higgs injected his wife Kathy with a lethal dose. The state's theory, my personal belief, is that Mr. Higgs had injected her with succinylcholine while she lie in bed, either while she was asleep or when she was first waking. It wouldn't take very much to be able to plunge a syringe in someone's body and push the plunger. It's hard to see people suffer like that. I have nightmares about somebody giving me a shot like that and you can't breathe and you can't move and you can't call for help and you know you're dying for minute upon minute. I mean, look at your watch for 20 minutes and know that that's how long it took her to die. I always wondered what he said to her when she was dying. Maybe he said nothing. Eventually, Higgs called 911. When Kathy Augustine was first hospitalized, the general belief was that it was an unexplained medical emergency. She was taken by ambulance from her home in the presence of her husband to the exclusion of any other cause. They settled on it being a medical event for which there were no symptoms and certainly no prior incidents of losing consciousness or problems with her cardiovascular system. She was a healthy, middle-aged woman with no significant medical history. 
news of Kathy Augustine's hospitalization made headlines. There was quite a bit of press coverage given in the first couple of days, and I had seen that press coverage and watched it thinking nothing significant, certainly not thinking or believing that it was a police matter at all. I saw it on the front page of the newspaper, like most people in our community, and, and it said something like, you know, State Controller Kathy Augustine is in the hospital in a coma. Then one phone call changed everything. While Kathy was alive and still hospitalized, but unconscious, I received a call from an individual who said they believed they might have information regarding uh, what had happened to Miss Augustine. The caller was Kim Ramey, a nurse Chaz had recently met at the hospital. When Ramey learned Kathy had been admitted to hospital in a coma, she recalled a concerning conversation she'd had with Chaz just the day before. She related to me that she had had some unusual conversations with Chaz Higgs um, in which he had uh, expressed a great deal of animus towards his wife, had made comments that he wished he were dead. Higgs also made the passing remark. If you want to kill somebody, you just hit him with a little sucks, and it's not traceable post-mortem. The police appear to have a case of aggravated assault on their hands. A few days after Ramey's phone call, the family, accompanied by Chaz, held a press conference on the steps of Kathy's workplace. They had made the agonizing decision to turn off her life support. He introduced himself as her husband and flanked by her family, her brother, her daughter. They held a news conference in front of the state capitol building and talked about the uh, circumstances surrounding her illness. Uh, he said that he, he simply had come in and she was not breathing and he, he tried CPR, he called 911, he introduced himself as a critical care nurse, which he was, and said that he had tried every life-saving measure he could and that she was seriously ill. He really didn't have any other information beyond that. It was obvious that her daughter, her brother, and, and more extended family were grieving deeply for her. When Kathy Augustine died, her death became a homicide. A police investigation was already underway. Well, the very first thing we did was contact the hospital laboratory to see if there had been uh, urine and blood samples taken when she was initially admitted into the hospital. Luckily, there were. Finding a laboratory that tested for succinylcholine wasn't easy. Only two existed in the country. The samples were sent to the FBI's laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. Meanwhile, police had to establish whether or not paramedics or medical staff had administered succinylcholine to Kathy. The process of identifying that substance in her uh, system was going to take several weeks. And so and immediately, we interviewed the paramedics. We interviewed the medical staff. We tried to interview Chaz Higgs, the husband. Mr. Higgs chose not to speak with us. It seemed unusual to me that the spouse of someone who just died would not have any interest in finding out what had happened, but uh, in this case, uh, exercised his right not to share any information with the police. Although Chaz Higgs refused to cooperate with the police, he did make an attempt to play the grieving widower. Higgs learned that an investigation had been initiated, and on the night before Kathy's funeral, Mr. Higgs made an attempt to commit suicide. There are two schools of thought in this particular case. One was that he could possibly have been filled with remorse over killing his wife. The second, and I think more likely, is that he was selfish and narcissistic and did not want to be held accountable for what he had done to his wife. 
despite a suicide note proclaiming his love for Kathy and blaming state officials for her death, police remained unswayed by Chaz's superficial grief. Instead, they were making disconcerting discoveries. Chaz Higgs had publicly stated uh, to a number of people that they had a wonderful relationship. However, uh, as we began to speak with co-workers, people who knew and associated with Mr. Higgs, they painted a very different picture. Uh, they painted a picture of an individual who had disdain, if not outright hatred for his wife, who often would make comments in passing that he wished she were dead. We also determined that he had uh, been pursuing a number of romantic interests outside of their marriage. So it was in complete conflict with what he was saying publicly. Actions that had previously been considered strange were now increasingly incriminating. When the ambulance pulls up, he's standing on the sidewalk out in front. Kathy Augustine is lying on the bed. Anyone who knows how to do CPR, and a critical care nurse would know how to do CPR, knows that you put a person who is in cardiac arrest on the floor or on a hard surface because then you can actually do chest compressions that are effective. She's still lying on the bed, and he's standing in front of the house. The paramedics described Mr. Higgs as they were driving with lights and siren to the hospital and he was accompanying them in the ambulance, that he was detached, unemotional, and in fact so distanced that he read the newspaper as they were driving in the ambulance. To my way of thinking, if your wife is critically ill and perhaps dying and you're rushing to the, the hospital in an ambulance, it's hard for me to picture most people reading a newspaper during that time. We found out about him going to the retirement system in Nevada while she was still in the hospital, but still in the coma, to sign up for her benefits if and when she died. And we thought that's strange. The supposedly grieving widower didn't let the death of his wife stop his roving eye. Over the ensuing months after the funeral, during the investigation, Chaz was carrying on uh, online relationships. Uh, he was romancing different women, said in a very offhand manner, I'm single now. Did I mention I'm single now? I'm single now. By September 2006, the toxicology report was back. Until we had a cause of death, we had no case. So the, the sucks toxicology gave us a case, and then it went forward from there. Within hours, a warrant was issued, and Chaz was arrested a couple days later. When he was arrested, he had uh, a packet of three by five cards. And then, you know, it was a thick like this and had a rubber band around it. The top one gave instructions on how to use and when to use succinylcholine. Out of the whole stack of cards, why was that one on top? The evidence kept piling up. In a backpack belonging to Chaz, police had also found a vial of another controlled drug, a short-acting anesthetic, Etomidate, and a drug administration handbook bookmarked at the page on succinylcholine. In December 2006, Chaz Higgs was charged with first-degree murder. Six months later, the trial began. Although Kim Ramey's testimony about her conversation with Chaz and the toxicology report were damning, the method of the murder was still in question. Then we had, well, how did he do it? Dr. Clark, the pathologist, found a uh, puncture wound on her buttocks. And it wasn't explained by any of the, the uh, therapeutic treatments she was receiving while she was in the hospital. 
and it looked like an injection site to her, to Dr. Clark. And so we went with, that's how I gave it to her. Other witnesses testified about Kathy and Chaz's relationship, Chaz's numerous affairs, and his open hostility towards Kathy. To the surprise of onlookers, the defense called Chaz to the stand. And I remember there was a thrill through the courtroom. It was a ripple. We didn't know if they were going to call him or not. And when they said, our next witness is Chaz Higgs, he stood up, he went up, and he testified for a good hour about his relationship with Kathy, about his love for her, about how he would never, ever, ever do something to her. He would never kill her. He would never raise a hand to her. That evening, he followed up his testimony with another dramatic act. The next morning, we were all in the courtroom again, ready for the prosecution to start their questioning. There's no Chaz Higgs there. Chaz attempted suicide again that night after telling his story. His attorney said, Your Honor, he had told his story and he felt he wanted to end his life. He had cut his wrists again. But once again, the superficial nature of his wounds became as conspicuous as his lies. I think he wanted sympathy. I think he wanted to control the situation. The bandages were visible out the sleeve of his coat. And other than that, there was no difference, as far as I could tell, in his appearance or his demeanor. I didn't yell at him or anything like that, but I said, you know, couldn't you cut your jugular vein? Wouldn't that have worked? Well, I don't know, I guess. You know, and he'd been spouting all through the trial about critical care nurse and I rely on my training, and that's why I wasn't emotional. And well, you can't have it both ways. Either you're trained and you know how stuff works, or you aren't. To prove his point, Bob asked Higgs to draw a diagram of his house. The purpose was to let the jury know that he wasn't hurt that bad. He could still write and draw and all that. I didn't really give a damn what he drew. Uh, sorry, but that's just the way I felt. Just do something, make him do something. Was this a true attempt, a true second attempt? Likely not. It was very effective. After probably an hour, hour and a half, he was done in more ways than one. On June 29th, 2007, the jury took seven hours to find Chaz Higgs guilty of the first degree murder of Kathy Augustine. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. You know, we lost a state leader. We lost a woman who had been inspiring to so many people. And she had made mistakes, of course she had, and, and hers were simply played out on a public stage. But what a tragedy. How sad uh, to die that way. A murderer could have walked free, but for luck, some benevolent force out there that assured that Kathy Augustine's death would not go unpunished. got sex, you got drugs, you got death. And they knew that there was a motive for murder. There's a lot of trust that's put into these people to make sure that they're truthful, they're honest, and that they're very thorough. And in this particular case, we don't know who to trust. It was just really horrifying. And she affected so many lives for nothing. At the start of the year 2000, the future looked bright for 26-year-old Greg de Villers. 
the son of a prominent doctor, Greg had graduated from the University of California, San Diego. This was an educated guy. This was an honorable man who thought he was doing the right thing. We know from his mom and his dad and his brothers that uh, he was a super sweet and giving guy. All his co-workers liked him. You know, he was just a sweet kid. The eldest of three brothers, in February 1995, Greg's life changed irrevocably when he met 18-year-old Kristen Rossum. She had a privileged background. Her father was in the Reagan Justice Administration. He was a professor of constitutional law. Her mother was a college professor. Her mother was a former advertising executive. She was highly intelligent, very bright, engaging, and she was always regarded as lovely in physical appearance. Very engaging personality, but as time went by, she developed some problems, particularly as it applied to substance abuse. One of the first substances she began to experiment with in college was actually marijuana. And then from that point, she progressed to methamphetamine. Kristen's early involvement with methamphetamine had gotten so bad that she wound up having to drop out of college. Her end goal was to become a chemist or a toxicologist. And uh, in her particular case, the wheels fell off in her life and she had to drop out of university. When Kristen met Greg, she had reached rock bottom. He was with his brothers. They were down at the US-Mexico border. She was on the run from her parents, from her meth habit. And she said, hey, you mind if I hang out with you guys? And she did. They went home that night together, Kristen and Greg, and that's how their relationship started. Here's what kind of guy he was. He got her off meth. He got her talking to her parents again. He basically rescued this girl. In the summer of 1999, the couple married. Her life began to turn around. He helped her uh, get off of drugs, and she completed her degree. And subsequently, she became a toxicologist. Kristen graduated with flying colors with a degree in chemistry. In 2000, newlyweds Greg and Kristen were living in an apartment in San Diego, affiliated with the university. While Greg was ensconced at the biotech startup, Kristen applied for a position at the office of the medical examiner. The medical examiner's office is in charge of determining the cause of death when there is no physician to sign a death certificate. This is the curious part about the medical examiner's office. It has a number of drugs, illicit drugs, street drugs. Why? Because when tests are performed to determine the contents of a person's bloodstream, you have to know what is in the person, you compare what's in the person to what you have in the lab. In March 2000, Kristen secured a job as a toxicologist there. Kristen was actually hired by the medical examiner's office. It would seem that her background was not very well vetted because she had a history of addiction, uh, specifically with methamphetamine, and this is not a good environment for her to be in. She's going to have access to all manner of drugs that are going to pass through the doors there. Kristen Rossum confronted the temptation of her past addiction every day she went to work. But another temptation emerged in the form of her married Australian supervisor, Dr. Michael Robertson. He was in charge of the entire section. He was the chief toxicologist. By June 2000, 22-year-old Rossum and 30-year-old Robertson had begun a sexual relationship. They had a love affair, and they didn't try to hide it at all. 
There was testimony during the trial that the two of them would go off together for lunch in the middle of the day. They would take a long lunch. It would be an hour, hour and a half. There is an email that was introduced during the trial from Robertson to Rossum in which he says, scream for me, babe. By October, Rossum was not only conducting a blatant affair with her boss, she was using meth again. On Thursday, November 2nd, Greg confronted Kristen. Greg DeVillish found out that his wife was having an affair with Michael Robertson. He also found out that she was using meth again. And he threatened to expose these truths to the authorities. The prospect of Kristen's relapse and affair with her boss becoming public would be disastrous for both Rossum and Robertson. Michael Robertson was here on a work visa. Rossum, of course, knew this. If Greg DeVillers would have been successful in alerting authorities that his wife was having an affair with her married co-worker, oh, and by the way, using drugs that she got from the medical examiner's office, she would have been fired. He would have been fired. That would have been the end of the love affair of Kristen Rossum and Michael Robertson. Kristen Rossum had to get Greg DeVillers out of the way so she could keep using meth and keep seeing Michael Robertson. A few weeks earlier, Kristen Rossum and Michael Robertson embarked on a business trip. A month before Greg DeVillers dies, Kristen Rossum, his wife, and Michael Robertson, her boss, are at a toxicological conference in Milwaukee. And they hear a presentation about fentanyl and how it's showing up in unintentional deaths and suicides. Basically, Kristen and Michael are getting a blueprint about how to murder Greg DeVillers. At the time, fentanyl patches were a relatively new method of delivering pain relief. If you had pain, for instance, it would be applied in a patch to your arm and subsequently uh, absorbed into your body to knock down any kind of pain that you might have. Much like uh, heroin uh, and other opiates, uh, fentanyl acts as a, uh, as a suppressant, a respiratory suppressant. So that means that it's gonna make you very groggy. It, it is an analgesic, so it's gonna knock down pain. But if given too much, it can actually send you into respiratory distress. Fentanyl is also extremely powerful. Morphine, which everyone is familiar with, we've had morphine around for years and years. It's also a pain suppressant that's in the opiate family. Fentanyl is almost 70 times stronger, and sometimes 80% stronger than morphine. In the year 2000, fentanyl was scarcely on the radar in overdose cases and was rarely tested. Back then, fentanyl wasn't very well known. In fact, fentanyl was so obscure that the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office did not screen for fentanyl during toxicological tests. Kristen Rossum and Michael Robertson knew this. On November the 6th, 2000, Rossum put a plan into action. It appeared that uh, Kristen took fentanyl patches off of the bodies of dead people, you know, put the patches on uh, her husband, and also had taken um, some of the standards. They have standards at the medical examiner's office that she uses for testing, and had taken some of that as well, and, and had put that all, you know, sort of applied it to Greg's body. How the fentanyl was administered to Greg's body remains unclear. Only Kristen Rossum knows for certain. What we do know is there was more than enough to kill him. 
The fentanyl basically will shut down your ability to breathe. You know, your breathing becomes slower and more labored and slower and more labored. I think you can imagine sort of the fear that he had, perhaps, or the confusion, you know, at some level about what his wife was doing or not doing. On the morning of Monday, November 6, 2000, Rossum left a voicemail at Greg's work saying he'd be off sick that day. Her story is that he was feeling better in the afternoon. She went out, came back, and took what she described as a long bath. She goes into the bedroom, according to her, and discovers that Greg is cold. Well, of course he was. She made sure of it. At 9.22 p.m., Rossum dialed 911. In the 911 call, Christian Rossum says, my husband's not breathing. There was lividity, however, where the blood starts to pool in the body. So Greg had been dead for a long time. Greg had taken such shallow breaths for so long that he was starting to develop pneumonia. His bladder was so full of urine that it would have been physically painful. Not just the feeling we've all had, hey, I really got to go. This is pain, which means he was alive for a long time, hours and hours. He wouldn't die. When the paramedics arrived, they walked in on what appeared to be a suicide. On the bed lay rose petals, echoing a scene from the film American Beauty. Kristen Rossum's story for the rose petals that are sprinkled at the death scene, the bedroom in the apartment they shared, Kristen Rossum's story is, oh, those came from a bouquet that Greg gave me a couple weeks before. Greg was ambulanced to hospital, where he was pronounced dead at 10.19 p.m. Police soon arrived at the apartment, based on the university campus. Because it was affiliated with the University of California, San Diego, guess which police agency did the initial investigation? An experienced police department with a homicide division that handles countless number of killings every year? No. A little university department that doesn't have much experience, if any, with homicides. And that's who showed up that night. The scene wasn't preserved. Any evidence was lost. This thing started bad from the beginning. When Greg dies, just like everybody else in San Diego County uh, that fits uh, the legal description of a coroner's case, his body falls under the jurisdiction of the medical examiners. The University of California San Diego police were going along with the theory that Greg committed suicide. So was the medical examiner's office. Initially, it was diagnosed as a overdose suicide, you know, but Greg's brothers in particular, Bertrand and Jerome, you know, sort of knowing their brother, knew that that couldn't possibly be the case. He wasn't a drug user. He wasn't depressed. He wasn't the kind of person who would take his life. And so they uh, immediately had concerns about that finding. Kristen, curiously, did not. Instead, she began making preparations for her husband's cremation. The heroes in this story are Greg DeVillers' brothers. They wouldn't accept the story that Greg committed suicide. They didn't believe it, and they certainly wouldn't accept the plan to cremate his remains immediately. They got a court order to stop it. 
they insisted on independent toxicological tests. They knew that she was having an affair with Michael Robertson. And so they sought outside um, representation to get another test to test all the toxics to see if there was anything that was missed, possibly. There was definitely some stuff missed. Um, the county did not test for fentanyl. And sure enough, that was what had ended up killing him. At the time that Greg died, his system actually had seven times uh, the normal uh, therapeutic level of fentanyl. The seemingly simple suicide case swiftly evolved into a suspicious death. San Diego Police Department was soon involved and received a call from a medical examiner office veteran. He thought they should know Rossum and Robertson had been having an affair. The plans for a future together for these two lovers were beginning to fall apart. On November the 24th, 2000, police interviewed Michael Robertson. Two weeks later, he and Kristen were dismissed from the office of the medical examiner. I was aware of the potential conflict if an employee of the medical examiner's office suffers a loss as a husband passing away, you're not gonna get those tests performed in-house. That's a massive conflict. So at the very least, we had this really unusual situation where somebody was gonna have to do something outside the normal procedures. Greg's autopsy showed he had three drugs in his system, clonazepam, oxycodone, and fentanyl. Isn't it a coincidence that the medical examiner's office is missing fentanyl, clonazepam, oxycodone, and methamphetamine? San Diego police requested a drug audit at the medical examiner's office. 15 fentanyl patches were missing. Now the prime suspect on June the 25th, 2001, Kristen Rossum was arrested for murder. Michael Robertson, meanwhile, had returned to Australia the month before. Kristen's bail was set at over $1 million. And after six months in custody, she was released when her parents paid the bond. She set to work on her defense. And I think the message was, this couldn't possibly be the woman that murdered Greg DeVillers. Why? She's beautiful. She has so much to live for. She gets a divorce. She gets a new apartment. She gets a new life. But a few days before the trial was due to start, police investigators found another piece of incriminating evidence. She's in the San Diego area, staying at a hotel. There was a 911 call. She had a panic attack because the prosecution revealed the existence of the receipt that showed she purchased a single rose on the day that Greg DeVillers died. That's the smoking rose. The single rose could have been the source of the petals that were sprinkled around Greg's body on the night that he died. In October 2002, the trial began, transfixing San Diego. Every day, Kristen Rossum would strut up to those doors dressed impeccably, sunglasses, blonde hair. She looked like a movie star. It might as well have been a red carpet. During the trial, Rossum made a surprising decision. Christian Rossum chose to testify, which is highly unusual. Obviously, you open yourself up for the prosecution. I'll never forget the prosecutor. Are you on drugs? Did you take anything this morning? 
That's like the first words out of his mouth. To say it was adversarial would be an understatement. When the jury delivered their verdict on November 12, 2002, it was the same day as Greg de Villa's birthday. Kristen Rossum was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That's the thing that we take away from this. The brother's love solved this murder. The brothers insisted on justice for Greg de Villers. Four years later, Greg's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Rossum and San Diego County. Although they eventually won the case, more tragedy befell the family during the process. During the litigation, but before trial, Greg's mom died of cancer. And so at that point, the brothers stepped into her case. So the actual plaintiffs in the case were the brothers, his two brothers and his dad. It was just really hard for them because, you know, everything got brought back up and everything had to be talked about what happened to Greg and they were just having a hard time. And then with the passing of their mother as well, they, you could tell it was, it was very hard for them. The events of November 6th, 2000, left one family without an adored son and brother, and reduced another to visiting a daughter behind the walls of the Central California Women's Facility. Apparently, Kristen Rossum wouldn't testify against Michael Robertson. Robertson has not returned to San Diego. You could tell that the DeVillers family had a certain bearing, a certain style. This was a good family. And what happened to them should never happen to anybody.